Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to start a series of videos on Jacques Ellul's The Technological Society in this in-depth reader's guide. We will walk through the entire text one chapter at a time, starting today with the first chapter titled Techniques. Now, you might have noticed that I already have a video on Ellul's Technological Society from about two years ago, summer 2019. But because that was a relatively short video on a very long book, I was only able to cover the big ideas of each chapter. But if you've actually read The Technological Society, you will know, of course, that it is a very dense book to read on a line-by-line -line level. And um, it's a great challenge, even for people who are very interested in learning what Elul had to say about technology. I really think there is a need for a reader's guide over this text, both in the sense of the, this YouTube series, which is beginning now, but also in maybe a more literal sense of the upcoming book, Jacques Delou and the Technological Society, A Reader's Guide by Chad Haig, which will indeed walk the reader through the whole text in an accessible manner, in even greater detail than you'll find in this series of videos, and we'll do this, ironically enough, by using references to anime, cinema, literature, and even video games to make Ilul's most sophisticated insights easy to understand in real time, along with making valuable connections to other notable anti-technological thinkers like, say, Ted Kaczynski, John Michael Greer, Penty Linkola, Martin Heidegger, John Zerzon, etc. Paperback and ebook editions will be available on Amazon as early as May of 2021. I also wanted to mention that this series of videos will um, largely be a part of the School of Forbidden Text. So the first video will indeed be publicly available, but starting from chapter two onwards, this will be a discussion for members of the school. But remember, you can join us there for as little as just $2 per month. Link to my Patreon is in the video description for just um, the cost of uh, like one cup of coffee at Starbucks or maybe even less, you can have a better educational experience than at a top so-called PhD program in the United States. So Jacques Ellul opened the text by noting that technique, or as most people would call it, technology, is certainly the most important, yet it is somehow the least understood subject today. Arguably, this is precisely because far too many people accept the naive view that technology is just machines. The grand irony of this error is that conceiving our world as a world of machines is actually a massive understatement, despite the fact that some estimates place the number of machines on Earth at some 75 billion, a stat which is itself several years out of date at this point anyway. Well, the machine might be the most obvious and the earliest example of technology in the sense of modern technique, but it is not by any means an exhaustive or satisfactory definition of what that actually means. More specifically, the kind of mechanization of inanimate material, which is achieved through unlocking the secret to how it functions as a naturalistic machine of sorts, might have historically preceded the more recent phenomenon whereby the same thing happens to humans, yet the ongoing mechanization of humans, which is also achieved through cracking the code to see how we function as biological machines which can be manipulated by anyone who has access to the roster of buttons which can be pushed to stimulate us into giving a certain desired reaction, is actually qualitatively indistinguishable from the former definition of technique, despite dealing with a domain of material which is far more expansive than that of the literal physical machines which we mistakenly consider to be under our control despite this fact. Proof that the formula technique equals machines is dead wrong can also be found in a very strange reversal which Elul noted, whereby the machine itself is revealed to be dependent upon technique rather than the other way around. That is to say, the artificial rationalization inherent in technique in this broader sense of the term is not just an accomplishment of some fancy AI program or some electronic brain thought of as a super advanced physical machine. Rather, this rationalization is something of an abstract presupposition which has to already be there in the background before that machine can even begin such execution. It is precisely 
essentially technique as an abstract system of artificial rationalization, which must determine the proper location and organization of the machines themselves, for they cannot simply exist in isolation, but must be incorporated into exactly the right position in order to maximize their own productivity and adaptability within this broader whole. Machines themselves are not self-contained holes which are filled with cogs to serve their own purposes as the naive view would hold, for machines are themselves only valued as cogs within this much broader system. What about humans, though? Far from being the master of the global technological system in its entirety, we too have fallen prey to the same fate of being nothing more than cogs which are only valued if we can fit into exactly the right position in this massive pseudo-organism. Likewise, if technique really is just machines in this narrow sense of the term, it would be something external to man and therefore totally under his control, much like the mecha robots in anime which simply channel the will and intentions of whatever human operator happens to hold the steering wheel, despite being far larger and far more powerful themselves than whatever little human seems to control them. However, if this formula turns out to be wrong, then even man's own substance is no longer any enduring notion of human nature, but is simply reduced to technique itself. There can no longer be any separation between man and his machines if technique becomes fully autonomous and develops something of a pseudo-life of its own, rather than simply wait for man to tell it what to do. This occurs precisely when technique becomes a superior form of know-how, rather than any one instantiation of physical machinery. When that happens, technique cannot help but be applied to all domains whatsoever because it is hardwired under those conditions as a self-propagating system to seek out the maximum possible scope and hardwired to fundamentally devalue any predecessor which came before it as so obviously inferior as to no longer be an option. This, of course, can happen even with human nature itself, which basically becomes obsolete and must be replaced by some transhumanist or posthumanist notion which is explicitly an upgrade over that. Once again, this is not at all to downplay the obvious fact that the machine is indeed quite useful as an example of pure technique, but that is only because technique causes any X whatsoever with which it comes into contact to have to be reinterpreted as a machine in some sense. For example, social media treats the human body as a machine for which the problem is how to get it to release six biochemicals with each like in order to create a literal addiction without having to ship any question physical substances over national borders. The hermeneutical degradation, however, whereby even professional academic philosophers who are supposed to be the kind of people who could see this for what it really is, simply accept that the only meaningful statements about humans whatsoever are such scientific ones detailing how the body functions as a machine are simply examples of this much broader problem of technology understood not as the individual machines themselves, but rather as an abstract system of rationalization which is hardwired to replace some spontaneous expression of natural life with an ordered formation oriented towards maximizing efficiency and adaptability. Further proof that technique simply is the abstract system of organization slash rationalization rather than any one of the particular physical units which submits to mechanization can also be found in the way that as technique progresses, humans are paradoxically forced to live in ever more inhuman conditions. Now, it little cites things like urban crowding, and in our era, even worse, a suburban sprawl is causing so much suffering, but just consider the way that an old house, which is perfectly habitable, like, say, a 19th century log cabin, but just happens to lack mostly meaningless modern conveniences like running water, electricity, central heating, etc., will be torn down for violating bogus regulations. The deeper truth, which must not be missed here, is simply that technique has literally made it illegal to be poor. This is only, however, because poverty, in a very biased and narrow definition of the term, is identified as a technical problem which must be eliminated in order to improve the efficiency of the social machine as a whole, rather than, obviously, any one person within it. You find that if you just happen to be a loser of a certain game of careers musical chairs, you're someone whose salary is not rising along with the usury industry's profits or the fraudulent stock values of a hand 
handful of technological companies. If you're not such a person, then um, you will be thrown from the frying pan of pre-modern cabins to the fire of actual homelessness. John Michael Greer noted, therefore, that newer technologies, such as you find in this example, are not actually any better at meeting human needs and are often much less enjoyable to use, in addition to being less functional and more ecologically costly. Citing any benefit to humans or even the consumerist claim to meet people's desires really cannot explain how technique advances. For the latter situation I just described is actually far worse than what it replaced from the standpoint of the humans who actually have to endure living under such conditions. It is only really from the standpoint of technique itself and its own hardwired drive to integrate every item which it finds into some system and build a new artificial ordering over the ruins which it had itself created. It's only that way that we can grasp how humans themselves have long since lost control of this process. Because technique had already long since become independent of the machine in the narrow sense of the term, it will note that technique had quite obviously also transcended the limits of economic production to encompass all activities whatsoever. Blaming capitalism for this sorry state of affairs is therefore not at all sufficient, because the machine in this broader Illulian sense encompasses far more than capitalism does. Technique causes everything to have to be considered in terms of the machine, whether it is strictly economic or not. Progress, by the way, is far broader than the Marxist notion of capitalism because even its supposed antithesis, communism, still fits within this same expectation that the only truths which are really worth knowing about human society are just the technical operations for how to make it function more efficiently as a giant social machine. The communism also accepts this perverse redefinition of the term growth, which was, of course, once thought of as an instinctive or organic process of, say, an Aristotle's fusus, a, a plant uh, developing its proper morphological form in accord with its own uh, nature. But now, of course, growth is purely rational. We have the growth of the economy, the growth of technical progress, the growth of social progress, etc., which both capitalism and communism unquestionably accept and only disagree over which method in particular will yield a better result from a strictly technical perspective. Technique's tendency to integrate everything into itself is, of course, also the true structural explanation of the SJW movement, which constantly changes the absolute values of linguistification, such as the current number of genders or the current sequence of letters after LGB, simply in order to tweak the social system to maximize its efficiency in incorporating the right new members and defeating rivals on a purely technical level. Gender pronouns are not any hermeneutical attempt to really know the truth as it is eternally, but are rather a set of methods which replace one another as outdated simply through being more efficient qua social technologies in this sense. The kind of adaptation required by technique, by the way, deconstructs any idea that humans can really stay separated from it, let alone claim to be fully in control of it, like Anita Sarkeesian's claim that all you have to do to make the entire global technological system woker is give feminist frequency <laughs> the um, ability to dictate the gender pronouns that it will use in video games. Similarly, in David Class's Caretaker trilogy, he completely missed precisely this point by assuming that insofar as man has to adapt to technology at all, it's only in order to figure out how to make it serve his wishes better. His image of a boy who travels back in time from a thousand years in the future in order to warn humans never to let ecological apocalypses of that time happen is somehow the same boy who need not push a button of any kind while piloting a submarine from this same apocalyptic future because the machine can simply read his mind and go wherever he wants it to go. Class could only write such an absurd book in which ecological catastrophes have technology act as the savior for the same problem which it itself creates because he assumes that environmental crises are the fault of humans simply using technology the wrong way by choice. Therefore, you don't need to do anything about the technology. You simply need to change the way that humans think by indoctrinating them with the kind of environmentalist values currently fashionable among Democrat politicians. <laughs> In contrast, if technology is not any one physical machine as such, but is rather just a form of superior rationalization, there's no longer any separation 
uh, between the two, for man is himself swept up in his entirety. Likewise, Elul warns that technique is not just applied science. That would presuppose that technology were just material reality plus some scientific formula, which were applied over it in a clean separation of the three. But of course, that would require technique's domain of influence to be clearly restricted to only one of these. Technique's domain is, of course, so broad that any formula always already is technique, rather than a disinterested, objective, eternal truth um, unearthed by people with no practical intentions. Actually, technique preceded science even within history, because primitive man had techniques for things like hunting, building fires, fishing, tool making, etc. The only thing which modern science really did that was different was that it allowed technique to launch into a linear trajectory of progress, but we must emphasize that this really meant that it allowed one method to replace another by fundamentally devaluing its predecessor. The problem with the formula that technique is applied science is that history shows that oftentimes the technology was invented long before the scientific explanation was fully worked out. For example, the steam engine was crafted through sheer trial and error some two centuries before the scientific explanation was made explicitly clear. Actually, scientific research is itself dependent now on technical means, as the scientist is no longer the image of a solitary genius who works simply out of a genuine sense of curiosity to know the truth and a love for the subject matter, but is rather himself now, or herself, just a cog within a much larger whole, somebody who trades his or her own personal freedom for the right, or rather the privilege, to use highly sophisticated, expensive equipment as well as to access the research grants and teams of other specialists which are a strict requirement for modern science to happen at all. This is not at all coincidental, for today it is not the frontiers of science in some epistemological sense, but rather the frontiers of man which are the issue as far as technique goes, because the technical phenomenon is actually more significant with regard to us than with regard to the realm of eternal truths. How then can one possibly define technique? Well, Mauss's definition that technique is, as I quote Elul, a group of movements, of actions generally and mostly manual, organized and traditional, all of which unite to reach a known end, makes an error by restricting technique to a type of manual activity, which might have been true in, say, like the, uh, the, the prehistoric era. This misses the point that technique is today largely an intellectual phenomenon, often carried out by the mind, or worse still, a pseudo-intellectual operation carried out by machines who have no human body parts at all. Mouse's definition also misses the point that modern technique is no longer reproduced organically by means of human transition from one living mind to another through a strict master and apprentice relation, because it's now become totally autonomous. It obeys its own laws without any need to consult human standards of judgment first, or even human standards of execution. More specifically, Elul noted that what Mauss said is really only valid till about the 18th century, or the era which predated the rise of modern technique. With modern technique, technology expands into epistemological realms like chemistry and physics, and social realms like psychoanalysis and sociology, and in fact, it now prefers to be applied to humans rather than over whatever material stuff humans might seek to mold to serve their own wishes. Technique is therefore not reducible to any teleological orientation towards economic gain. You could consider Boy Scouts, for example, as a certain rationalization of human behavior, which is actually not, you know, intent on making money in any sort of business sense. Technique is also not strictly correlated with productivity because the hydrogen bomb pre presents a very chilling example of a very sophisticated and um, admittedly well-designed technology which exists for the sole purpose of destruction. In fact, it will know himself that nothing equals the perfection of our war machines. Warships and warplanes are vastly more perfect than their counterparts within the civilian world. The organization of the army, in fact, its transport, supplies, administration, is much more precise than any civilian organization. This is because the smallest error in the realm of war could cost countless lives and would be measured in terms of victory or defeat as such. Yet still, no production goes on there, for efficiency and adaptability are ends of their own, which are 
not at all superstructural reiterations of the Marxist economic thing in itself, which is really there in the background. <laughs> Technical progress cannot be measured strictly in terms of economic productivity because what is true of economic productivity is not true of te technical progress in general, says Ilul himself. This bias that technique must always be really about economic prosperity for us is, of course, just humans' attempt to evaluate a process whose logic vastly exceeds them. Above all, therefore, Ilul argued that one can understand what technology is only through contrasting the kind of spontaneous forms which simply express a naturalistic force such as life. Um, with the kind of strict forms which are explicitly favored over their competitors simply through having greater efficiency. By these standards, it really is true that even prehistoric hunter-gatherers had technique in some sense, because they had methods to gather fruit. Um, but what characterizes technical action within a particular activity, says Ulul, is just the search for greater efficiency. For this reason, Elul actually is more radical even than John Surzon because he refuses to fall for the trap of romanticizing hunter-gatherers as people who live completely outside the influence of technology, despite the fact that these people have not committed the original sin of domestication, which Zerzan would consider to be the presupposition of any technology in that sense. Hunter-gatherers exhibit the trend whereby completely natural and spontaneous effort is indeed replaced over time by a complex of acts designed to improve things like, say, the yield. One can only really understand why Elul sees past the Zerzan fallacy, as we might call it, by undertaking a serious history of technique which had never really been done before Elul himself. Elul showed that, defined properly, technical activity actually is the most primitive activity of man, since even prehistoric hunter-gatherers had methods for hunting, foraging, and somewhat later for weapon-making. Likewise, whereas Zerzan identified the origin of technique as the original sin of domestication, Elul admits that the origin of technique really is a total mystery. It's almost futile to look for the time in the vastly distant past when man was still completely free of technique because this sort of invention is exactly what separates man from animals in the first place, because he's the one who can mysteriously bridge a gap between mere instinct and the technical act as such. Nor was this just an attempt to mimic what he had already seen in nature itself, for Elul agrees with Hegel that man has always worshipped his own handiwork far more than he revered nature. Hegel's claim that art is in fact more beautiful to the human eye than nature continues even in the modern worship of sci-fi among the same um, rationalists, so-called, who might uh, consider themselves to be beyond such talk from the Enlightenment era. Despite the fact that technique is so old as to be present not just in pre-modern but even in prehistoric times, it will warn the reader that there were in fact two paths along which technique evolved in history. Now the more obvious one is of course that of Homo Faber, or man the maker, the concept that human beings are able to control their fate and their environment as a result of the use of tools, as defined by Wikipedia, but we also have to acknowledge magic, and Elul says himself it might be, it might seem questionable to call it magic technique, but it really is in the strictest sense of the word because it developed along with other techniques as an expression of man's will to obtain certain results of a spiritual order. To attain them, man made use of an aggregate of rights, formulas, and procedures which, once established, are not supposed to vary. Strict adherence to such forms is one of the characteristics of magic, but also of technique. Whether considered through tool-making or through magic, technique serves as an intermediary between weak man and scary nature, and therefore, in both cases, um, provides something of an assimilation of chaos into order in Jordan Peterson's sense that the human subject requires as a presupposition for it to be able to function at all. Still, with these two streams of technique, magic was actually the first of the two, but due to materialist biases, it continues to be neglected by people who act as though Homer Faber is the only definition of technique. 
A bit like Kaczynski argued that self-propagating systems will actually be better understood if you don't bring all the emotional baggage associated with words like technology, which leads someone like Ray Kurzweil to say that it'll make me live forever, <laughs> and Sarkeesian to say that it'll obviously side with feminists over misogynists because progress. It will gets us to focus on magic in order to uh, allow us to realize the morphological features of technique which have nothing to do with what we would consider today to be technology. Magic is also neglected, however, because um, it does not fit the expectation that technique should have progress. Magic was, of course, tied to specific ethnic groups and would die along with the social group in which it was embedded if it could no longer be transmitted from one human mind to another in the old-fashioned sense of master and apprentice. We also neglect magic in considerations of technique for the following reason. Because the scope of magic was always local, in contrast with the global scope of modern technology, there really was no diffusion of it to other locales. Magical techniques operated adjacent to one another rather than progress in a single line of development. And because one human civilization dies and leaves behind um, its material tools, we could uh, examine those later from an archaeological standpoint, but the magical rites as performed by the practitioners largely vanished once that sort of social foundation disappeared. Magical efficiency is also not always easy to measure because it might deal with effects on an interior or spiritual realm, which is not exactly open to observation today. With these criteria established, Elul revealed that taking the easy way out by simply blaming the West for technique is not only silly, it's also historically inaccurate, because technique is essentially oriental, he says. It was principally in the Near East that it first developed, and it had very little in the way of the kind of scientific foundation characteristic of Greek thought. The Greeks really were not about technique, but rather about pure contemplation. You could compare, for example, the way that geometry in ancient Egypt was quite literally earth measurement for agricultural purposes with regard to um, getting uh, the maximum yield um, in accord with the Nile's flooding cycles. But geometry for the Greeks was an axiomatic science about abstractions which definitively do not exist as material objects. For Euclid, you only really have a point or a line if it's the ideal one. For Plato, it's only really a circle or a square if it's not anything which could be materially encountered, but rather is just the purified idea in the world of forms. Even someone like Archimedes, who had a machine to facilitate with calculation, had it destroyed after it had demonstrated the exactness of his numerical reckonings. Now, obviously, the Greeks could have just applied all of this mathematical knowledge in a way similar to what we do today, but they consciously chose not to. In other words, the reasons they didn't have a technological society were not simply the negative ones of ignorance, as we would assume today, rather the positive reasons, such as a respect for nature, and also the Greek ethical virtue of self-control, the kind of self-mastery which Julius Evola noted as um, a characteristic, generally, of the world of tradition. But of course, the lack of interest in manual activity on grounds that those were things which slaves had did, also had a big uh, role to play in this. Uh, the free man for the ancient Greeks was quite literally the one who could study the liberal arts, which, let's keep in mind, is uh, arts uh, to be studied by someone who's not a slave, um, precisely because he wasn't engaged in those sort of manual activities. Specific um, scientific thought, I should say, to the extent that you do have it at this time, is simply for the purpose of wisdom. It is not a means to an end to manipulate physical matter to force it to do what you tell it to. Rome, in contrast, really was the perfection of social technique in the pre-modern world, both in the military realm, quite obviously, but also in the civil realm. It's because Rome concerned itself not with the kind of abstract thought favored by the Greeks, but rather with gaining an exact view of a concrete situation which they attempted to turn to account with the fewest possible means. Their ideal was that of a certain social organization founded on an equilibrium, 
rather than a substitution between the human factor and technical factor. This equilibrium would allow them to operate and to assert themselves in a certain cohesion of society which would be achieved without the explicit use of force. This was, of course, only for technical reasons that it was favored because Rome is economical in all things, even the use of force, says Elul. This also led them to realize within the realm of military that they, the unit of operation was the mass itself rather than the single heroic individual who would be immortalized in epic. This was, of course, understood by Julius Evola to be a sign of decline, but then again, that's another word for saying it was technology. In contrast with Greek contemplation, therefore, Romans actually did develop many animal-powered machines, the proof that they had the technical attitude even without the fossil fuels which we take for granted today. They had a remarkable grasp of applied ability, which allowed them to do this on an energy budget would, which would be considered laughably small by modern standards. Also in the realm of law, the Romans possessed a remarkable understanding of applicability. Their judicial system could be applied always and everywhere within the empire because technique is hardwired to treat that which it encounters as an anonymous generic cog rather than a natural individual. For this reason, it's kind of silly to blame Christianity for technique when Christians were despised in ancient Rome precisely for not assimilating into the Roman legal techniques. It was because the Christians held judicial and other technical activity in such contempt that they were considered the enemies of the human race, and not only because they opposed Caesar, said Elul himself. In addition, the Christian centuries of the West, like the Middle Ages, were characterized by the breakdown of Roman technique in every area. As Lewis says himself, organization as well as construction of cities, industry, transport, the list goes on. And to the extent that you even had great architectural developments in the Middle Ages, these were um, an exception, but one more, uh, which was wholly uh, motivated by religious concerns rather than any sort of technical orientation. In fact, the only new technique of reasoning you get in the Middle Ages was that of scholastic philosophy, but this was a um, pseudoscience by modern standards which considers the essence of angels and how many of them can fit on the head of a pin to be serious questions. This is why even after centuries of church-sponsored um, scholarship within this field, you never actually saw any progress occur within it. Nor is this only a problem for medieval or Catholic Christianity, because even the Protestant Reformation really can't explain how modern technique came about, as Max Weber wildly exaggerated the effect of Calvinist theology on bringing about capitalism through the Protestant work ethic. Christianity, one might be reminded, actually inherently opposes things like amassing material wealth, let alone actually bringing about the kind of rapid and unsustainable economic growth required by modern technology. It also required an ethical evaluation of situations, which was not simply reducible to utilitarian concerns of usefulness, let alone economic concerns of productivity or profit. Christianity is anti-technological by its very essence for the additional reason that if the world is going to end soon anyway with the second coming of Christ, there's not really any use trying to accumulate wealth Anyway, likewise, even after you see the Protestant Reformation from, say, the 16th and 17th centuries, you see an era which is so anti-technical that even the intellectual treatises are um, on, on subjects like law, economy, medicine, or history um, will strike the reader forcibly with the complete absence of logical ordering which they exhibit. They seem to be instead guided only by the author's own fancy. In such texts, it will noted, we find few tables of contents, no references, no division into sections, no indices, no chronology, sometimes not even page numbers. <laughs> even within serious intellectual work of the time, we have an antithesis of technique because here purely personal reflection and private experience guide the process, even in treatises written by literal mathematicians. You consider Pascal's Pensée as a great example of this, for which nobody today actually really knows the proper order in which all of these sayings are supposed to be presented. The, the lack of clear restriction to any one subdomain in which they're treating all knowledge in just one book is, of course, 
something which would be considered a technical failure today, but that's exactly the point. The goal here is not to use a system to solve a problem, but rather to make personal contact with the author by reading his thoughts in a much more personal manner. Although it is true that the 18th century saw the explosion of technique as such, one must bear in mind that the Industrial Revolution was not only a revolution of mis machines, but was a certain rearrangement of the world, a change which is not simply in the use of a natural force like, say, fossil fuels, but in the application of technique to all spheres of life. And so far as there was an Industrial Revolution, this was just a smaller subset of a much broader technical revolution, defined as the emergence of a state that was truly conscious of itself and autonomous in relation to anything which did not serve its interests. We all know that the Industrial Revolution saw the invention of various new physical machines, but it little reminds us that there was a certain technologization also in the realm of administration and police power. This was the period of rationalized systems, unified hierarchies, card industries, and regular reports in that realm too. While it is true that the Industrial Revolution saw a certain dissolution of archaic social fetishisms, which is of course celebrated by Habermas as the realization of the public sphere in, say, 18th century British coffee houses, anyone can now participate as a speaker with no further social qualifications. This is really not the best way to describe what happened, because this is not so much the positive phenomenon of democratic equality under the law, but rather the negative fact that under modern technique, everyone must now serve in accordance with the strictures of technique, because the latter can tolerate no more privileged persons, no special interests, because the systematization Unification and clarification must be applied to everything without exception, says Elul himself. Likewise, he largely considers the rise of modern technique in the 18th century to be a mystery, in that even fossil fuels can't explain it in a cause-effect relation. It was not for Elul that you uh, access coal and then there's a memological shift afterwards, as the early Hague would say. Rather, Elul notes that you only put coal to use for technical purposes because there's already a certain technical mindset, a certain technical attitude attitude in place beforehand. In contrast with the mystery of technique in the 18th century, he notes that the inventions of the 19th century really all do quite easily fit into an explanation um, through uh, uh, being members of a chain of one technique replacing one another, not through being better on moralistic grounds or any other standard of humanistic evaluation, but simply through outcompeting its predecessor in the strictly amoral terms of having greater efficiency and adaptability. For this reason, the myth of progress does not cause technique to happen in blatant uh, um, disagreement with the early Hague, of course, because the myth of social progress, along with the technological progress in the narrower sense of machinery, which begins in the 18th century, are, of course, maybe just side effects of the rise of modern technique as such. For this reason, he notes that in the 19th century, you have to focus on the conjunction in time of five phenomena to understand what's going on on like a sociological level. These are the fruition of a long technical experience population expansion, the suitability of the economic environment, the plasticity of the social milieu, and the appearance of a clear technical intention. We'll go through these five factors one at a time. Likewise, the first factor is the fruition of a long line of development with a clear genealogy of one determinate ancestor being replaced by a clearly superior offspring, which is, of course, the logic of technique itself. And the second factor, Elul largely agrees with Linkola that overpopulation is somehow the presupposition which is already there in the background for all of the other technical excesses to go on. You might consider uh, Elul's quote that the growth of population entails a growth of needs which cannot be satisfied except by technical development. You might um, consider how the very need to feed 7 billion humans really can only be satisfied by modern technology. People are right in criticizing John Zerzan for not addressing the inconvenient fact that even if everyone returned to hunting and gathering tomorrow without exception, only a tiny fraction of today's population could actually do that. You could not have 7 billion uh, hunters and gatherers on this earth, but rather a much more modest global population. In addition, human resources provide necessary material for technique, not only in the form of labor, quite obviously, but also in uh, research. And that is something which you can only get, of course, through sustaining overpopulation, even while pretending to fight it.
That goes to the third factor, emphasizes that the economic milieu must be in the paradoxical state of being both stable and in flux, but in just the right ways. It must negate, for example, the fixed customs of tradition, but it must still be stable enough that primary technical research can be devoted to well-defined objects without any intrusions or disruptions to the process. And the fourth factor, he notes that the social milieu must have plasticity so that the loss of taboos and natural social groups can result in the kind of people who can fit in as cogs within the um, global system as such, rather than any local community, let alone extended family. Contrary to stereotype, in other words, the taboos of religion and royal hierarchy are um, indeed antithetical to technical development in the sense that technique is quite literally sacrilegious. <laughs> he noted that um, the conviction that a nat natural hierarchy really exists which nothing can modify which would put the nobility and the clergy and above all the king into a position which could not be questioned are eliminated not because they are um, problematic on moral grounds but rather because they're impediments to the technical functioning of the system itself even in the case of um seemingly uh, less significant <laughs> social formations than that of the king, like, say, guilds and religious groups, these also impede the spread of technique, because if there's an invention within a guild, the secret would be hoarded among their own members, just as the extended family would certainly do as well. It's not a coincidence that... Um, any bias towards one's own family eventually becomes something like a crime punishable under law as a form of corruption, despite the fact that that was basically the norm in a pre-modern, pre-technical world. What is unique, however, about our era is the appearance of a clear technical intention, and this is the fifth factor. He notes that Hegel and Marx really are not solutions to this factor in particular, but are rather partly to blame for it, or at least to blame for explicitly linguistifying what this means within words and within a sophisticated philosophy even. Marx kind of got right, for example, that there was historically a connection between technique and the bourgeoisie, not for any deep philosophical reason, of course, but simply because they realized that they could make money from the development of technology, or as Marx would say, they could make surplus value from it. However, even the financial self-interest of the bourgeoisie was not in itself enough to explain the rise of modern technique, let alone its sustained development over centuries. In fact, what Marx got wrong was precisely that the masses' revolt against technique for its threat to their livelihoods as workers was something which was initially um, gaining traction. It was uh, gaining momentum, but he halted it by redeeming technique in their eyes by promising that continued technical development in the context of dialectical materialism would in fact bring about the collapse of the bourgeoisie and of capitalism. In fact, it was precisely because technique was early on thought of as a means of advancing the interests of only one class that, as late as 1848, it was still possible to see popular revolts against it. At that time, workers still saw machines as threats to their income without yet being intoxicated by all the empty pleasures of living in a technological simulation. They could still, therefore, identify technique as the cause of their suffering. Ironically, Marx caused them to have less social consciousness or class consciousness about the cause of their sufferings through advancing the pseudo-logic of dialectical materialism, which really was not a good description of the logic of technique, which was something quite different. What Marx got wrong in particular was just his attempt to convince the workers that it was not technique as such, but rather its human masters, qua the capitalist owners, who caused all the social inequality. Of course, we see this um, in display also in George Orwell's Animal Farm, in which removing the one human guy who owned the farm really didn't change anything. It actually just made the inequality much worse. By promising, however, an evolution to a higher social form, which would supposedly follow after a leap in the material base, which of course is just a euphemism for saying it's a technical leap, Marx made them pseudo-accelerationists who actually advanced their own oppression by accelerating technique under the mistaken impression that they were moving the uh, inevitable dialectical process forward. Yet Marx's adjustment of ideology was not in itself enough to redeem technique in the workers' eyes. For that to occur, you had 
to have a second historical fact coincide with it, which was that people subjectively felt the benefits of technique through receiving a higher standard of living, something which uh, um, Elul also critiqued heavily within his work Propaganda, in which he noted that the first world standard of living really is a trap because it establishes the presupposition for the kind of person who can basically not even resist being propagandized. In fact, even Marx himself posited the outcome of the revolution as a higher standard of living for the masses, which, as Tinkasinski noted, really can only mean more technology.